Our second reading comes from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. That's on page 218 of the New Testament on the Pew Bible, if you wish to follow along. Listen again to the word of God. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his servants flames of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And in the beginning, Lord, you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing. Like a cloak, you will roll them up, and like clothing, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never end. This is the word of the Lord. Famous last words. If you could script your parting shot like Jim Nance does, the Final Four or the Masters, what would you want to say? Lots of famous people simply express their love for maybe a spouse or their family. But there are some humorous, even ironic examples of some famous or maybe infamous last words. And I just want to share a few of those. Composer Gustav Mahler died in bed while pretending to conduct an orchestra. And it was in that moment he exclaimed, Mozart! Secretary of State William Henry Seward was asked if he had any final words, and his response was, nothing, only love one another. Nostradamus, famous for his predictions, said, tomorrow at sunrise, I shall no longer be here. That's one he got right. Richard B. Mellon and his brother Andrew had a game of tag that lasted around 70 years, and on his deathbed, Richard called Andrew over and whispered, last tag, and Andrew was it for four years until he died. Leonardo da Vinci, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. It's pretty amazing to think of. At age 84, Benjamin Franklin's daughter told him to change positions so he could breathe easier. He said a dying man can do nothing easy. Murderer James W. Rogers faced a firing squad in Utah, and he was asked for a last request. Bring me a bulletproof vest. (laughs) Another murderer, Thomas J. Grasso, wasn't happy with his last meal. He said... I did not get my SpaghettiOs. I got spaghetti, and I want the press to know this. Just a couple more. Wilson Meisner, a playwright, was approached by a priest who said, I'm sure you want to talk with me. He told the priest, why should I talk to you? I've been talking to your boss. Elvis, unfortunately, shared with his then fiancé, 
I'm going to the bathroom to read. Last one, though. Yeah. This is my favorite. Steve Jobs, founder of Apple. Visionary, creator of many, many amazing things, right? Is reported by his sister to have just simply said three times, Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Makes you wonder what he was experiencing in that moment. And so thanks to the website Mental Floss for that little compilation. It remains a strong tradition to focus on Jesus' last words during the season of Lent. Weekly services and messages are based around them, and it can be extremely powerful. But I thought maybe in this season of Easter, instead of focusing on Jesus' last words, we might focus on his first words, as recorded in Scripture. And so for the coming weeks, we will get into those. But I thought today, maybe it's important to remind ourselves or perhaps share with someone for the first time why Jesus has the authority he does, right? After a while, we, we typically pay attention to people's words, whether it's last words, first words, when they're famous or noteworthy. Jesus is more than just famous or noteworthy. So let's look at how Jesus is God's final word. The very beginning of creation, as recorded in Genesis, begins with God speaking everything into creation, out of nothing. God's words are incredibly powerful. God had this message of love and salvation he longed to share with his people. And so, over time, prophets became a primary channel of communication. And it was like each prophet received a different piece of the puzzle. And piece by piece, something became, began to come together, but it was not yet complete. Now, chances are you've tried to complete a puzzle, and you might have experienced what it's like to try to put a puzzle together, only to find that one piece is missing. Yeah, it's so frustrating. What the writer of Hebrews is telling us is that the final piece to this puzzle, to God's communication, is Jesus, God's Son. Jesus is God's final word in communication. Prior to Jesus' incarnation, right, forgiveness and purification for sins came through an elaborate sacrificial system. And it was never ending because the results of those sacrifices were temporary. But in Jesus Christ, we know salvation now to be very different. Good Friday recalled the day Jesus died for the atonement of our sins. He was the sacrifice. He achieved something we could never do and no amount of sacrifices could ever do. The eternal purification of our sins. His qualifications for that sacrifice come in that he is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. Now, when looking at our children, Hudson is often referred to as my mini-me, and Colton is Chelsea's mini-me. Uh, growing up, I was told I looked like my mom, right? Children often reflect their parents. But they're not clones. I can't say that Hudson is an exact imprint of my being. And for his sake, I'm glad that he's not. Because I want him and I want Colton to have a greater impact than Chelsea and I have, right? We want more for our children, and, and more doesn't mean abundance of stuff and spoiling them with material things. It means more impact on people's lives for the sake of the kingdom. But Jesus was the exact imprint. 
one example of an imprint at that time that we can still relate to. Well, if you, you remember what coins are, kids? Um, that was maybe the best example of an imprint at the time that Hebrews was written. Uh, you know, take an emperor. He would commission someone to create his official image, and that could be translated into a stamp that was then pressed onto metal and distributed. N.T. Wright imagines how an emperor had been wanting for a long time to tell his subjects who he was, to give them a good idea of his character. And supposing the metal stamp or die hadn't been invented yet, the emperor would only be able to send out drawings or sketches, which might tell people something but wouldn't give them the full picture. Then at last, the reality. Hard metal on soft, original picture, exactly reproduced. Yes, says the writer, God had for a long time been sending advanced sketches of himself to his people, but now he's given us his exact portrait. Jesus is God's final word on salvation. And the result of this imprint, this salvation, is his exaltation. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. One reason Jesus was uh, executed was because he did not fulfill the hopes and expectations that many had for the Messiah. They wanted the Messiah to overthrow the earthly Romans and establish a kingdom, but Jesus taught that his kingdom was not an earthly one. The people that wanted that were not thinking big enough. Just coming off the glory of Easter Sunday, we might look at Jesus' resurrection and ascension as referenced here in Hebrews 1 and think that's his final exaltation. But there's one more step. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself, with, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call and with the sound of God's trumpet will descend from heaven. We proclaim that he is coming back and his return will be the culmination of his exaltation. Verse 12 alludes to this. Bob Wood writes that scientists have set forth what is called the second law of thermodynamics, the belief that the universe is gradually losing heat and is thus slowly running down. The Bible says it more poetically by describing the universe as an old garment that gradually is becoming worn out. Christ will roll the heavens and the earth up as one rolls up an old garment and lays it aside no more. Heaven and earth as we know them will be exchanged for new heavens and a new earth. Jesus is God's final word on exaltation. Now when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain and they witnessed his transfiguration, a rare moment that they got to experience Jesus' full divinity on display, they heard a voice from a cloud say, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. We have much to listen and learn from Jesus' first words. Because he is God's final word. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.